To begin, it's important that you know what a general beam coordination process looks like. Then you will better understand the rest of the presented materials. In a typical beam coordination process, a representative from each industry creates their model. This team of professionals is led by a beam specialist or a beam leader. He or she is responsible for the development and quality of their industry models. At certain intervals, their models are sent to the BIM coordinator. The BIM coordinator then receives all the models and combines them into one federated model. This model then is used to perform a model check. Then, as agreed in a project's BIM execution plan, the BIM coordinator runs class detection at various stages of the project. To do so, we usually use coordination programs like, for example, Navisworks or Solibri. The beam coordinator goes through the list of collisions and adds uh, his comments, also decides the priority level of an issue and designates the person or a department responsible for uh, the fix. The beam coordinator will then uh, send coordination reports to each industry before the scheduled coordination meetings. Major clashes and coordination issues are highlighted during these meetings to encourage the responsible team to resolve them. Remember that coordination is much more than just a clash detection. The key to successful coordination is to not only identify issues, but also know how to prioritize them. You need to designate a relevant person to address them and track the issues until they are resolved. So let's discuss how a BIM coordinator can effectively do this. Before we begin the process of finding clashes, let me show you two concepts that make this process easier for us. The first concept is known as system hierarchy. The system hierarchy tells us which disciplines are fixed with little room for change and which can be altered more easily. The disciplines which appear right at the bottom are those with elements that are difficult or expensive to alter. While the disciplines at the top are those which have the greatest uh, freedom of movement. So depending on the type of the project, its requirements and what the national regulations are, you may have a slightly different order of hierarchy, which I present here. However, a typical construction projects will look like more or less like this. So first, we create a structural or architectural elements, which form the core or a base for the project. Architectural and structural elements are also often considered as frozen and all other trades will need to work around them. Secondly, we have main mechanical ducts. These are objects of high volume and little possibility of relocation in later stages of a design. Third are smaller systems that can more easily change position or be altered. An example of these would be plumbing systems or smaller ducts and pipes. Fourth are electrical systems. And the last comes fire protection and other minor systems, which are quite flexible and uh, whose placement can be adjusted with relative ease. Okay, the second concept is a clash matrix or a coordination matrix. The hierarchy system helps us build a clash matrix in a simple table, as you can see here on the picture. The matrix outlines all models that need to be coordinated. As you can see, there are numbers in the table. The numbers specify the order in which the clash detection occurs. As mentioned earlier, we treat clashes found in the structural and also uh, architectural model as higher priority, because these disciplines have a direct impact on the location of other building systems. By using a clash matrix, I can easily create a list of clash tests, and then I can use this in the coordination program. Here, for example, you can see a clash test that I created in Navisworks. Note how the numerical order of clash test corresponds to numerical order in clash matrix. It gives a clear picture of which clash test should be prioritized. The higher the number on the list, the higher the priority. As you can see, we first check the architectural versus structural models. That's why I put number one at the beginning. Then we check HVAC systems with architectural and structural components and so on. Okay, so now that we have a clash matrix table, we can create our clash tests accordingly and begin to resolve the issues. Okay, so now let's look at a few examples of the issues 
we may encounter during beam coordination and how I would personally handle them. First, I will discuss high priority issues. The first priority issues is where components have been duplicated. Duplicate items are quite common. However, this type of errors occurs only in the model because in reality, no one can put two of the same elements in the same place on site. But in beam coordination, however, it is considered as a high priority issue, but fortunately, one that is easy to fix. The most common reason why this happened is that a designer accidentally copied and pasted the same item twice. It could also be that person from two different industries didn't agree beforehand on who would be responsible for including that element in their model, hence the duplication. If an element is duplicated, it would cause errors when creating a bill of quantities or a bill of materials. Whichever industry the duplicated elements belongs to will be responsible for resolving the issue. I will assign this issue to a beam leader of this team in a report and then set a priority as high. Another issue that I consider to be high priority ones are intersections with doors, with windows, also columns and beams. These are obvious design flows that will cause substantial problems on the construction site if we don't find them in the coordination process. The majority of the elements that collide with structural and electrical elements are considered a priority. As you can see from my list on Navisworks clash tests, these type of tests are high on the list. I usually assign such clashes as critical as they need to be fixed as soon as possible after detection. There are actually several reasons why such clashes may occur, but these two are, uh, I think, most common ones. So first, a designer could be using out-of-the-date models as an overlay to design their systems. Second, an architect or a structural designers could have made design changes without informing the MEP and disciplines, which results in collisions in the model. Of course, there may be exceptions where designers or architects will have to adapt their elements uh, to MEP systems, but such cases are quite rare and can be decided between trades. Another type of clash, which is treated as obvious issue with a high priority, is intersections between elements with parallel or crossing orientation. As you can see here in the picture, we have ducts that collide with the wall and go along the wall. The orientation of the duct is important here. If the duct was perpendicular to the wall, it wouldn't be considered as a problem. But on the other hand, if the duct goes along the wall, or at irregular angle, it is usually considered as a quite big issue. There are a number of reasons why this issue can occur, but the most common is not using the latest structural or architectural models as an overlay for a system design. Another cause is frequent design changes over a short period of time. As you can guess, the MEP industry respons is responsible for these issues and needs to correct it they will need to change the position of the duct so it doesn't collide with the wall. There are times, however, when large-sized ducts and pipes collide with partition walls. In such cases, it may be faster and cheaper to move the lightweight partition walls and leave the duct as it is. However, these individual examples should be discussed internally between disciplines. Okay. I have now shown you some examples of clashes that are often considered high priority by me. These are selected by the BIM coordinator and then presented during coordination meetings. Decisions on how to resolve them are often made on site so that changes to the design can be made as quickly as possible. As a BIM coordinator, you will also need to sort through numerous uh, low priority issues. So now let's consider a few examples of those type of issues. First, let's look at the intersections of small diameter pipes. Often this type of conflicts occurs in places where there is a high density of pipes or ducts. For example, on a healthcare project, there might be a number of specialized rooms that need advanced mechanical, hydraulical, or uh, electrical systems in place. I often consider them as a low priority issues and don't present them at the coordination meetings because their occurrences uh, does not affect uh, other industries actually. Uh, they don't have a large impact also on uh, the design solutions, especially structural elements. 
Of course, these problems will need to be resolved, but they can usually wait until all high priority issues uh, have first been dealt with. Deciding who is responsible for this type of issue may not be as obvious as with structural elements. Here it's worth looking at the clash matrix table to see which one has been given a higher priority and a lower priority. Remember, it is not always the case that the smaller elements with smaller diameters have lower priority than larger ones. For example, the location of fire sprinkles in some cases is more important than electrical cable trays because constraints like building regulations come into play. So you should always keep those things in mind. Another example of low priority issues are pipes penetrating partition walls where penetrations haven't been modeled. On many projects, I've encountered situations where pipes from hydraulic or mechanical systems go through a partition wall. Why are such collisions considered low priority? Do they not collide with the architectural walls which are given top priority in the system hierarchy? Correct, but you know, as with everything else, there are some exceptions. Partition walls are not structural elements whose changes will result in changes to other systems. Holes can be easily made in such walls and this is done on the construction side. Whether or not uh, openings will be added to the model would depend on the internal project modeling policy. In the past projects that I've worked on, often an additional model with penetration holes was added to overall federated model. If objects like ducts or pipes went through these cutouts, then such instances weren't considered as issues. But if, however, there was no such cutouts, then I created an issue and selected an MEP team as the industry who is responsible. Finally, I wanted to show you an example of collision that often occurs in BIM models, which I usually don't consider a real clash and don't add coordination reports at all. These are cases where mechanical air terminal or valve matches the face of the wall as shown here in the picture. In many projects I found that designers don't include air terminal openings in their models. If we have many rooms, the coordination program will find many of these issues. The list of cases to be checked is long and sometimes overwhelming. There is a solution for this. In coordination programs such as Solibri Office, we have an option to automatically ignore specific issues. In the checking rule settings, it is worth going to exceptions section. In the new dialog, we specify where the tolerance of protrusion of an air terminal or a valve that matches the face of the wall. Then, the next time Solibri checks the model, these cases will not appear in the results. If the protrusion does exceed the tolerance value, so for example the air terminal protrudes more than a specified value, from the face of the wall, then they are not ignored and those cases are considered as issues. Of course, these are just some of the issues that BIM coordinator may encounter in his work. I hope I made the topic a bit clearer and you've learned something useful from this video.